I'd like to invite uh, Beth Mott to uh, talk about um, the powerful owl. Thanks. Off, and then you can shout. Uh, I wanted to talk to you today about um, citizen science and the role it's playing in finding some fantastic data to protect the vulnerable species, the powerful owl. Um, <clears throat> so powerful owl don't exist here in uh, Adelaide. You don't find them here, but they occur all the way from Mackay down the east coast to the border of South Australia. And their status is uh, a vulnerable species through Queensland and New South Wales. And then as we get down into Victoria now, and particularly in South Australia, they're classified as endangered. Um, <coughs> birds, I work for BirdLife Australia, which is a not-for-profit bird research and conservation organisation. And within birds, uh, BirdLife Australia, the, project, the Powerful Owl project is managed by two different groups of people. The Threatened Bird Network, which is a community-based program that uh, involves the community directly in conservation actions for birds. Um, and the Powerful Owl project applies to this project manager because, of course, we're dealing with a species that's in decline. And the other project manager is the Birds in Backyards project, headed by Holly, who you may have heard speaking yesterday. And that project is really um, interested in working out what happens to birds in urban environments particularly birds that live in the areas that where we live. And of course, we're really interested in this project in understanding what's happening to powerful owl in the urban space, because we know a bit about what goes on for powerful owl in the rural space, but less about what goes on in the urban space. And it seems, particularly from the research of a lot of people in New South Wales, that um, large forest owls are in decline in um, rural spaces with no reason, with no explicable reason. And so we might see that the urban space is starting to become a real stronghold for some of these species that are disappearing. So let me introduce you to the owls that you'll find with the powerful owl along the east coast of Australia. Some of you hopefully may have seen some of these before. That's our powerful owl, cashing his dinner. He's powerful because he holds on to things. And of course, it's the biggest owl that we have in Australia. And with these guys, we may see owls like mast owls, barn owls, booble cows, barking owls and sooty owls. And while we pin our efforts for conservation on the powerful owl, in fact, uh, these other three species of owl in the red circles are actually uh, exist in population numbers only about half as many as powerful owl. So those estimates for powerful owl, the official estimate is about 2,000 individuals, and that jumps to about 5,000 depending on who you speak to, but for some of these other species we know we've only got about 3,000 individuals left. So anything we can do to help these guys, of course, we need to try and do. So hopefully there's some audio here. I don't know whether the audio system's on and it'll play for us, but this is the powerful owl. You're looking at a fledgling in this picture. Um, they, as I said, they're Australia's largest owl. They stand at about 65 centimetres and the wingspan is 1.35, which I measured from my elbow to my fingertips. So that's the size of bird that we're looking at. <coughs> that's Mrs. Powerful Owl. <laughs> um, she makes a lovely dulcet call. Here's her boyfriend. <coughs> It gets a bit bassy and the gold standard for our researchers at the moment is of course to hear whether or not we have breeding and when we have chicks in a site you'll hear this. So let's talk about what the project actually aims to do with these things. We have two quite distinct arms of the project. The first of them of these is to, um, to understand the ecology of urban powerful owls by looking at breeding behaviour, success, diet, habitat and mortality and injury and that's the part of the the project that volunteers are directly involved in. And the second um, part of the project is really to engage the community in the conservation of owls and their habitat by educating, um, by training land managers, uh, by involving everybody who wants to be involved in the research and of course by providing an adv advocacy avenue for people to actually do things about things that are causing detriment to animals in their area. Um, one of the things that I think is most important about citizen science projects is not that lots of people come together and gather fantastic data and then give it to scientists and then we go and do something with it. A really good citizen science project really needs to give back to the people that are involved in the project themselves. So in this project we really try to do these things. We try to value um, all of the input of our volunteers and really that means working out because the, the volunteers that come to the project are incredibly varied in their strengths and if we can recognise that and include those strengths it actually makes the strength of our research better as well. So we get a lot of um, people who have different ideas and strengths within the project to contribute back to the project by teaching other volunteers. 
Um, we make sure that our volunteers are educated, not just in the process of collecting data and how to do that well, but also that they, try to, they understand the scientific underpinning of what the project's about. Um, <clears throat> because that way we can, of course, teach people how to collect data better for ourselves, and they themselves are educated. The, one of the other things that I'm quite passionate about is actually teaching um, people to survey ethically because there's no point collecting data if the data that we collect is biased by the way that we collect it. And I think many projects ignore this quite badly and particularly when we're dealing with a species that vulnerable, that's vulnerable, we have to be careful about the way that we collect the data. And of course, if we add all of those things together, I hope that what we create is a really empowered group of volunteers. And certainly, that's, that empowerment is definitely working. Uh, here's an example of one group of people that are involved in the Power Flower project. There are actually five of them. One of them is really camera shy, so we never see her. Um, and together, these guys have um, developed a whole heap of community actions focused on con conservation of owls and of the forest in their area. And um, they do things like they've written two books now about powerful owls and conservation. Um, they have numerous contacts with the with the council where they um, do community outreach events specifically involved in building habitat and they also now have a half hour radio show that runs weekly that's focused specifically on conservation actions for animals in their area. So I think sometimes we need to look at not just the data that we as scientists can go and use to build you know, whatever the research outcomes are but to actually look at what else the project can bring and I think that's a fantastic example of what citizen science can do in that it can um, inspire communities to make their own conservation actions which of course pushes our movement forward. So I thought I'd just run quickly through some of the, um, the outcomes that the research arm of the project has actually um, pulled together in the last uh, seven years that the project's been running. Firstly, we have uh, about 530 registered volunteers and about 200 people that actively contribute data to it. So it's much smaller than many of the other citizen science projects you will have heard about today. But I think that the data that we generate has really good impact for the species. We monitor, monitor about 174 powerflower territories. Of those, about 90% of them are breeding or have just bred. Um, one of the things that everyone wants to know about when we're talking about vulnerable species is how many are there. We don't actually know how many powerful owl are there. there are, and having a look at some of the research I was reading about the other day, um, the estimate is that you would need 18 visits to a site to actually identify whether they even occurred or didn't occur at a site. So they're quite hard to find. So community actions like this that focus and provide education to people to be able to find the birds for a start are really, really um, crucial to, to um, moving forward in terms of our conservation. What we do know about fledgling success in, this, uh, in the project is that in the last two years, owls that have been breeding in the city breed really well. And in fact, the um, success in breeding is about 75% higher in our urban powerful owl than it is in their forest dwelling counterparts in the last couple of years. And that seems to be increasing. But I guess um, congruent with excellent breeding is the fact that owls are also dying. Um, and so we have our mortality, which usually sits at about 10% of the uh, population within the, uh, the Sydney Basin now moving up to about 14% mortality in the last two years per annum. So most of those mortalities are associated with car strike, but we're having a few other things come in that are starting to kill ours as well. Having a look at, about, at, at where ours are breeding within the urban um, landscape, a couple of things become really, really obvious. The first is that um, edges are incredibly important for power flower because most of the breeding occurs within 100 metres of the urban boundary, but in fact if you look more carefully at the data it's usually within 50 metres of the urban boundary and of course those edges are the things that are most prone to disturbance when we have urban expansion or when we control our green patches for fire or whatever else we do. So um, the way that we manage edges needs to become more of a focus for conserving this species particularly because our impacts in the edge as we expand are very high. You may have heard um, John Martin talk about the cockatoo wing tag project. So he was involved with a bit of research um, in the previous season to look at how owls moved through the urban landscape. And one of the things that was most striking about that research was understanding that there's a really strong correlation between urbanisation and owl territory. And those owls that are existing in really high density urban areas have to travel about five times further to go and get tea than those owls that are existing in places where there is more green patch. But I think the thing that was most 
um, interesting to me about that research was really the fact that even really tiny patches of green space within the urban matrix tend to be incredibly important for Pafalau, not just for young dispersing away from the natal territories, but also for, um, for birds as they forage. Um, one of the other things that we know about Pafalau is that diet is shifting, and it's shifting to include ground fauna. So we had this um, perception about owls that they only actually hunted arboreal prey. In fact, that's not the case at all. Um, they're now shifting, particularly in those high-density territories, towards rats and rabbits. And of course, rats and rabbits are the things that we selectively poison in urban environments. And one of the um, things that we need to think about is the way that we manage land to keep owls there. And of course, for land managers, that means controlling the sorts of poisons that we use. It's not something that we really thought about, but given that cow are coming into our urban spaces, being really aware of that becomes very important if we want to conserve the species. One of the other things that we've been doing is trying to find an effective mitigation for powerful owl breeding. Because powerful owl only breed in tree hollows, the hollows they use will take 150 years to grow. And unfortunately, those hollow bearing trees are the ones that we selectively remove from the environment all the time in the urban space. Uh, of course, trying to find something that we can replicate those tree hollows with becomes actually really important. Unfortunately, um, <coughs> We've tried lots of mitigations for the past 15 years and never actually had one work, or only in one instance, but we've got a new round of nest boxes going up within the next two weeks that actually are designed to replicate hollows for the first time rather than just being nest boxes, so have to watch this space to see whether or not these will work. And one of the other things that we, we've been working on is identifying developing urban threats, particularly looking at collision, which I'll talk about. So where is it that we're going next, having gathered all that data with the help of our volunteers? Um, firstly, we need to continue, of course, to educate people to value our habitat, which doesn't just mean fantastic sclerophyll forest, it also means the small green patches within the urban matrix, and of course, the other bits within the urban matrix itself, which are important for Papala, which include hills horses. In fact, they're very popular. Um, we need to try to understand the tree hollows better. You might be able to see, can anyone see a little interaction going on there? Can you see a little interaction? <laughs> this is a spotted pard light that's actually sharing that hollow with the owls as they nested. This is one of the owlets from the southern part of Sydney this season just finished. Um, but this, this, because this hollow is such prime real estate, we're finding that there's a great deal of competition going on between other birds and the owlets for those holes. And of course we know hollows are important for a whole heap of other range of fauna as well. Um, <coughs> And we're finding that there's a lot of negative interaction. We know that cockatoos and, nat and um, honeybees are a real problem for owls in hollows, but now this season we've actually seen other uh, conspecific interactions. So uh, kookaburras have been killing owlets as well. And there's been a whole heap of owls killing owls at the same time. So we really need to understand better how tree hollows work for this species so we can preserve them. And of course, we need to have a look at where it is that owls are dying, and that involves understanding the way they move through the environment, and of course, understanding what we can do to change the way we move through in the environment to avoid interactions between owls and vehicles. And I think one of the last things that I'd really like to say is that um, <coughs> citizen science is an incredibly powerful tool. We all know that, that's why we're here today. And I think we're making great effort, even in a small project like this, to make a beautiful difference for Powerflower by incorporating our excellent project volunteers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beth.